congruence classes are certain subsets of the integers that have some nice properties. It turns out there exist uh, generalizations of the concept of a congruence class that works not only for the group of integers, but actually for any group. This generalization is called a coset. So let's start with the definition. So let G be any group and H be a subgroup of G. A left coset of H in G is a subset of G of the form little g h and it consists of the following elements it's that little g times any little h in h so if you change g here you might get a different coset so that's a left coset because this g is at the left side of h uh, and the group g need not necessarily be abelian so it might matter actually on which side you put g and on which side you put h so you fix a little g and then you allow it to be multiplied by any element of h. And if you do this, you get a certain subset of the group g and that's called a left coset. By changing this little g to a different little g, you might get a different left coset, although you might get the same left coset. Uh, you'll see it soon in examples. A right coset of h and g is a subset of g of the form like this, where we still fix little g and then multiply it on the left by any possible uh, little h in the subgroup h. So let's do a few examples. So as I have already mentioned, the coset is supposed to be a generalization of a congruence class. So congruence classes must be our prime examples of cosets. So what is g and h in that case? So the group G would be the integers, and the operation would be um, addition. <clears throat> the subgroup, let's just do subgroup H to be the uh, integers that are multiples of 4. That are multiples of 4. What's a good notation for such a set of integers that are multiples of 4? Uh, how about 4z? Okay, I think that's a good notation because I'm thinking about this as set consisting of integers that look like 4 times some other integer. So there are multiples of 4. Note that multiples of 4 actually are a subgroup of G because um, if I add any two multiples of 4, I get a multiple of 4. 0 is a multiple of 4. And then the negative of any multiple of 4 is also a multiple of 4. So this H forms a subgroup. OK, so now I want to study various cosets of this, of this H. So I want to look at elements like this, GH. OK, I want to look at first at left cosets. However, what's here in between this GH? Well, it's supposed to be something like this, G, H, where H is in H. And what is here in between? Well, that is the invisible binary operation. Okay? And that this one's supposed to also be that invisible binary operation when you, we, we're thinking this is just a good notation for, for that uh, for that set, where we think, okay, take G and multiply by any element of H. When I say multiply, I, say, I mean use the binary operation in G. All right, what's the binary operation in the integers? Well, that's addition. So I probably should put a plus here in between the G and the H. So let's first pick some element in, in the G. How about 1? So that's an integer. So I'm going to look at this at this coset, 1, okay, so instead of not writing anything or writing a dot, I'm just going to write a plus because that's the binary operation in Z. 1 plus, and what's H? 4Z. Look, this looks exactly, I mean, the notation is uh, even the same as for congruence classes. And what is this? According to the coset definition, that's my little g, right? So, so this, maybe I should say it like this, that's the little g is this.
So little g is equal to 1. So that's going to be 1 plus anything here. So plus, let's just say at n, where n is in 4z, which means it's just 1 plus 4 times something. Okay? And look, this is exactly uh, a congruence class uh, of 1 in z. So what else could I choose for g? Oh, I could just 2. And of course, according to the definition, I get 2 plus n, where n is in 4z. Right? This is the h. This is this, this 4z is h. I can do 3. Look, all I'm doing is just recreating what congruence classes are. I could choose 0, for which I would just probably not write anything, just 4z. So that's, of course, a 0 plus n, where n is divisible by 4. I could choose 5. But you quickly notice that 5 plus 4z is the same as 1 plus 4z. As you already know, 6 plus 4z is the same as minus 2 plus 4z, and so on. So different little g's can produce different cosets, but they don't have to. Right? 1 and 2 produce different cosets, but 1 and 5 do not produce different cosets. They actually produce the same coset, and so on. So these are left cosets of 4z inside z. What about right cosets? Well, in this case, there's not going to be any difference because right coset, because the addition is, is commutative. So right cosets will be the same as left cosets. So this, for example, is the same as 4z plus 3. Okay? We never use this, this notation for congruence classes. We only use 3 plus 4z. But if you think about this, this as being a coset, this is an equally legal notation. It's just that it somehow doesn't matter. If the group G is abelian, left cosets and right cosets are the same thing, right? Because by definition, this is nothing else but n plus 3, where n is in 4z. So clearly the same thing as 3 plus 4z, and so on. All right, um, what about other groups? So you see, abelian groups are maybe not that interesting. Well, I don't know, maybe they are interesting. Uh, let's do one more abelian group, and then we, we'll switch to non-abelian groups. Uh, let's take, for so example, 2. We'll take um, the group of sixth roots of unity. What will be h? h will be the group of cube roots of, uh, cube roots of unity. So there are definitely, um, this is a subgroup, right? Every cube root of unity is also a sixth root of unity. Um, let's actually write down what this thing looks like. So that's 1, zeta 3, and zeta 3 squared. Um, while well, this thing looks like 1, zeta 6, zeta 6 squared, zeta 6 cubed, zeta 6 to the 4th, zeta 6 to the 5, um, where, of course, zeta 6 is cosine 2 pi over 6 plus i sine 2 pi over 6, and zeta 3 is cosine 2 pi over 3 plus i sine 2 pi over 3, and as you know very well, zeta 3 is nothing else but the square of zeta 6. Okay, so let's look at some cosets of h uh, in g. And as you already know, it's enough if we just look at left cosets because the group is abelian, so it doesn't matter which way I look at it. Um, so first, how about 1h? Okay, it's really 1 times h here, so 1h. Uh, that is a coset. So what it does is it takes its elements of the form 1 times h, where h is in h. All right. So what is in h? Well, it's 1, zeta 3, and zeta 3 squared. So I just get 1, zeta 3, and zeta 3 squared. Okay? And that immediately gives you the, the observation that, uh, so note in general, E H is H E is H. This coset, when you just take the identity as a representative, you get just a subgroup. Uh, let's take something else. How about we'll try zeta 6 squared, all right? Let's try that. 
what do I get? So that's zeta 6 squared times h, where h is in h. So what do I get? That's zeta 6 squared times 1. That's zeta 6 squared. Zeta 6 squared times zeta 3. But zeta 3 is zeta 6 squared, so that's zeta 6 to the fourth. And finally, zeta 6 squared times zeta 3 squared, but zeta 3 squared would be zeta 6 to the fourth. So that's zeta 6 to the sixth. And you see that's again h, right? Because that's just zeta 3, that's zeta 3 squared, and that's 1. Oh, so taking zeta 6 squared actually didn't produce any new cosine. Um, all right. Working on a hunch, I'll take zeta 6 and see if I get a new cosine. So that's zeta 6 times everything in h. So zeta 6 times 1, that's zeta 6. Zeta 6 times zeta 3. Zeta 3 is zeta 6 squared. So that's zeta 6 times zeta 6 times zeta 6 squared. So that's zeta 6 cubed. And finally, zeta 6 times zeta 6 to the fourth. That's zeta 6 to the 5. Did I get a different coset? Oh yeah, right? It's a different element. So this is definitely different from h. And in fact, note that they have no elements in common. Not only they are different cosets, they even do not share any element. This one is 1 zeta 6 squared, zeta 6 to the fourth, and this one is only the odd powers. All right? I'm not going to try the rest of them. You can try, and you will see that whenever you use an even power of zeta 6, you're going to get h. Whenever you get an odd power, you're going to get this other coset. So there are only two possibilities here. And we're going to prove in the next video that indeed that's true of any cosets, that they either are the same cosets, so they have the same elements, or they, have, or they share, share absolutely no elements, so they're destroyed. Okay, let's look at examples of some cosets in non-abelian groups. And for that, let's take S, S3. Okay, that's sort of uh, quite a simple uh, non-abelian group. So let's write down what the elements are. So remember, this is the symplectic group on three letters. So that means this is the group consisting of permutations of the set 1, 2, 3. So what permutations of 1, 2, 3 can you have? Well, first of all, you can have the do-nothing permutation, so E. Secondly, you can have the permutation that switches 1 and 2 and fixes 3. That's called a transposition. Another transposition is, so two cycle, right? A two cycle is a transposition. One, three. So that one that, that switches one and three and fixes two. And I can also have two, three. So this is the transposition that fixes one and switches two and three. And then there are three cycles. One, two, three. One goes to two, two goes to three, three goes to one. Nothing gets fixed. So that's definitely not anywhere there. One, three, two. Oh, remember, it's possible to write uh, the same permutation in two different ways. Is that permutation the same as that permutation? No, it's not, because this one maps 1 to 2, and this one maps 1 to 3. So as functions, there are different permutations. Okay, that's it, because I know S3 has six elements, three factorial, and I already listed six different elements, so that must be it. So that's going to be my G. And I'm going to take H to be the group consisting of E and the transposition 1, 2. First of all, you might ask, is this a group? Is this a subgroup? Well, what do you have to check? You have to check that it's uh, closed under the operation, that the identity is there, and that the inverses are there. But all this is clear for this group. Um, of course, if I multiply identity by itself, I get identity. Identity by times the transposition is uh, 1, 2, the other way around also gives you 1, 2, and this thing squared is the identity. Um, the identity is there, and this thing is its own inverse. So it is a subgroup. Okay, so that's going to be H. So let's look at various cosets. So you already know that one coset is going to be H itself, in other words, EH. So that consists of E and 1, 2. So let's try something else. Now let's see what happens if I use 1, 2. So that's 1, 2, h, where h is in h. 
So that means I'm taking 1, 2 and multiplying it by every one of these elements. But 1, 2 times the identity is give, gonna give me 1, 2. And 1, 2 times 1, 2, again, 1, 2 is an element of order 2. So that gives me the identity. So I got H again. I didn't get anything new. Okay, let's try something else then. Um, how about maybe one of these three cycles? One, two, three, H. What do I get then? So that's one, two, three, H. When little H is in H, what do I get? One, two, three times the identity. That's one, two, three. Oh, you already see I'm getting a different coset. 1, 2, 3 times 1, 2. I need to compute that. 1, 2, 3, 1, 2. What do I get if I compose these two cycles? So, opening parentheses, what happens to 1? 1 goes to 2, and then 2 goes to 3, so 1 goes to 3. What happens to 3? No 3 here, 3 goes to 1. Oh, so I close my cycle. So 2 has to be fixed, but just a sanity check that that's really the case. 2 goes to 1, 1 goes to 2, so indeed 2 is fixed. So, 1, 3. Okay. Um, let's try something else. I already got two different cosets. Um, maybe the other three cycle. Or let's make, I don't know, let's use a transposition. Okay, 1, 3. What do we get then? 1, 3 times E, that's 1, 3. And then I have to do 1, 3 times 1, 2. So that's what? 1 goes to 2, and that's the end. What happens to 2? 2 goes to 1, 1 goes to 3, so it's 1, 2, 3. Oh, again I get the same coset. So these two are the same, just as these two are the same. Okay, so I tested four elements and got two different cosets so far. So let's test more. Let's use, um, I don't know, let's do 2, 3. We haven't tried that one yet. What do we get? So that's 2, 3, H, as H is in H, what do I get then? So that's 2, 3 times the identity, that's 2, 3. 2, 3 times 1, 2. Well, let's compute this, 2, 3, 1, 2. So that means 1 goes to 2, 2 goes to 3, so that's 1, 3. Um, now what happens to 3? Three? 3 goes to 2. 1, 3, 2. Okay, 1, 3, 2. Yet another different coset. Again, nothing in common, right? These three cosets have nothing in common. So you can check that the last possibility, namely 1, 3, 2, H, is actually equal to, to this one. So these were left cosets. Let's compute right cosets now. So one right coset is, of course, just H. So these two are the same. They're called the trivial cosets. So they are just a subgroup, so they are the same. Let's look at these other ones. So um, how about I do one, two, three on the right? By definition, that's h times 1, 2, 3, as h is in h. What do I get? Okay, so e, where is h? Here, e times 1, 2, 3, that's 1, 2, 3. And then I have to do 1, 2 times 1, 2, 3. That is, okay, going from the right, 1 goes to 2, 2 goes to 1. Also, 1 gets fixed, so I'm not going to write that. Now what happens to 2? Two? 2 goes to 3. And that must be it, right? Uh, 3 goes to 1, 1 goes to 2. This is fine, so it's 2, 3. Okay, which coset did we get? Did we get any one of those? Um, let's just check. This element here is in this coset. And um, that element here... Well, it's not in this one. It's here. So we got a completely different coset. One that took one element from this one and one that took one element from that one. So this shows you that in a non-abelian group, 
left cosets and the right cosets don't have to be the same. Like this one is a completely new, it didn't show up among the left cosets. Um, so let's compute maybe one more left coset uh, and that will complete our, our list. So let's do um, one three. You can do all the rest of them, you'll see, but you're gonna get, always get one of those. So that's h times one three, where h is in h. What do we get? So um, e times one three is one three. And now I have to do one two times one three. Oh, wrong parentheses. One two one three is one goes to three. Um, what happens to three? Three goes to one, one goes to two. So it's one, three, two. Again, you won't find this coset among these three, right? So here we had, these were, these were the left cosets here on the left. And on the right, we have this and that. These were the right cosets. But still look, among the right cosets, they are still distinct. Right? These elements show up only in this coset, these elements only in this coset, and the elements of the group H only in the original coset. One more example with the same group but different subgroup. Let's now take the subgroup generated by the three cycles. That subgroup actually has a name. It's called A3. So it's E123 and 1, 3, 2. I'll leave you to check that this is a subgroup. Note that this is some element G and this is just G squared. All right, so of course one coset is this, A3, so that's E A3, and that's the same thing as A3 E. So let's take now something that isn't inside A3, because I kind of have a hunch that if I take something from A3, I might get the same thing. So I'll take something that isn't in A3, so maybe 1, 2. So that's by definition 1, 2, H, where H is in A3. Right, this is my H. Okay, so what is it? 1, 2 times E, that's 1, 2. Unfortunately, I erased these calculations that I had a moment ago, so I have to do them again. 1, 2 times 1, 3. 1, 2, 3. 1, 2, 1, 2, 3. What is this? 1 goes to 2, 2 goes to 1, so 1 gets fixed. 2 goes to 3, and that must be it. Let's check. 3 goes to 1, 1 goes to 2, yes. Okay, what else is left? 1, 2 times 1, 3, 2. What do we get? 1 goes to 3. 3 goes to 2, 2 goes to 1, so that's it, 1, 3. Note that we again get something disjoint from this. In fact, here we got half of the elements of S3, and here we got the other half. Um, let's compute the right coset for the same element. So. So that's H12. All right, what happens then? So E times 1, 2 is 1, 2. So now I need to do 1, 2, 3, 1, 2. So that's 1 goes to 2, 2 goes to 3, so that's 1, 3. Now, no 3 here, 3 goes to 1, so that closes here. 1, 3. Note, when I did this the other way around, I got that. When I do it in this way, I got this, which is actually that element here. So the last one to do is to do 1, 3, 2 times 1, 2. And what do we get from that? 1 goes to 2, 2 goes to 1. So 1 is fixed. 2 goes to 1, 1 goes to 3. Uh, 2 goes to 1, 1 goes to 3. So 2 goes to 3. What's the conclusion? We got the same thing. These two cosets are the same.
okay? And I mean, sort of giving you an idea already ahead because all the cosets are either equal or disjoint. These must be the only cosets that exist. All the other cosets must be equal to either these two, I mean, they're the same coset, or to the subgroup because these two cosets already exhaust all the elements. So this, despite the fact that S3 was a non-abelian group, in fact, the left cosets are equal to the right cosets. There are only two cosets. The identity coset is equal to itself, and the 1, 2, A3, and A3, A1, 2 are the same coset as well. So for some subgroups, left cosets are equal to right cosets, and for some subgroups, that's not the case. Okay? Later, we will see that when that is actually the case, that the left cosets are equal to right cosets, you can build something nice something like having various congruence classes we were able to look at the ring or now a group consisting of congruence classes because an analog of a congruence class is a coset when these left cosets are equal to right cosets we'll be able to speak of a group of cosets cosets themselves will form a group which will be called a quotient group